so um, thank you for coming. Uh, this is a talk I'm going to present at RSA the week after next. Uh, it's called Area Detection in Monotone Span Programs and how they can be used in uh, multi-party computation. Um, this is joint work with Nigel. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about what this uh, title means as we go through. Uh, the outline is roughly about what MPC is. Um, I'm going to talk about the specific goal of this paper. Uh, I'm going to talk about the tools that we need to construct our protocol and then I'll give sort of an overview of how the protocol works. Okay, so what is multi-party computation? Well, we, we suppose we've got a set of parties who've got some secret inputs and they want to compute some function on their combined secret inputs. Um, multi-party computation allows them to do that without having to trust a third party. So one of the uh, obvious ways of computing on some private data would be to outsource it to some trusted third party, here's a notice by F on the left, um, getting F to do all of the computation and returning it to the parties. But that doesn't protect the privacy of the information, so instead what the parties do is run a protocol amongst them, um, and we have various guarantees of the protocol, uh, like that it should uh, be correct, so the parties get the correct output of the function. The data is kept private through the protocol execution, and there are some other things you can require as well, like fairness, which basically says that uh, all of the parties should get the output if at least one of them does. Okay, and we have these uh, strong models of uh, security in MPC, uh, which basically says that any adversary against the protocol in the real world, on the right, um, should not learn anything more than an, I, uh, than an adversary can learn if it's interacting with a trusted third party. Okay, um, the protocol is only a presenter in the universal compatibility model, which I'm not going to talk about much, but if you're familiar with it, uh, that's what we're doing. Okay, as a sort of motivational example, uh, suppose you've got a hospital with some private uh, uh, patient data, and you've got maybe I don't know, some um, tax records or something um, held by some other uh, set of parties, and a university wants to come along and do some research and look at the statistics of whether or not everybody's got the same access to the healthcare that they should have. Um, so what they could do is that those two organisations could just give all their data to the university who could compute on it and, and let everybody know their analysis. Uh, but this isn't great because um, the hospital then has to, and the, and the person with the tax records, they have to trust that the university is keeping the data secure. They have to trust that nobody is going to be able to interfere with the data. Um, and get hold of it when um, it's being transferred and things like that. So this is kind of an, um, a possible application of MPC. And uh, MPC is quite um, high dimensional. Uh, we can talk about computing uh, on the right um, uh, arithmetic circuits, general arithmetic circuits, additions and multiplications, and, um, things in some finite field. Um, or we can compute on Boolean circuits. Um, and then we can think about things that are slightly more specific. So we've got private set intersection now. You've got two, two parties who've got a data set and they want to compute the private intersection of, of the intersection of those data sets, they can do that. And then private auction is another example. And then we can talk about different types of adversary we want, we want to protect against. So in that previous uh, example, uh, a hospital might be trusted to run the protocol correctly. Um, and that's, that's what we, we would call a uh, we, we would have a protocol which is so-called passively secure. Um, but it might be that some of the people with the data want to uh, try and uh, learn extra information about the data and they might deviate from the protocol description and that's an active adversary. And then there's other types of adversary too and there's different methods of MPC um, which I won't talk about much. But uh, in this protocol uh, we're going to be looking at how to compute arithmetic circuits, um, and we're going to look at how to optimize for communication efficiency between the parties as they act in the protocol. Um, we're going to do this with active security, so again, that's where the parties can, uh, the parties may deviate arbitrarily from the protocol description. Um, and we're going to look at QTO active structures, which I haven't described yet, but um, we'll see them shortly. And we have a general goal, which is that for general access structures, we're looking at specific set of access structures. In general, um, 
we want to be able to do NPC uh, regardless of uh, who we uh, think might be corrupt. Okay, so uh, what, what is an access structure? Right, so uh, here we've got uh, a set of four parties, one, two, three, and four, um, and we've got, uh, this is just the subsets of that set of parties, and the edges um, of that graph represent the subsets and supersets. Okay, so an access structure defines who should have access to a given secret. So here we have what's called a 4 1 threshold access structure, which is where one party on its own can't learn any information, but any set of two parties or more should be able to learn and recover any secret that's shared amongst the parties. Um, in that case, we had a very rigid uh, um, structure and um, it depended only on the number of parties in, in the set that was trying to learn information. We can be more general and define, uh, as you see here, um, party one collaborating with either two, three, or four can learn any secret. Um, but uh, any other set of, any other pair of parties can't learn anything. And we have this monotonicity property which says that um, if, uh, if a set is qualified to learn any secret, then um, any superset of that set should also be able to learn it, and vice versa for unqualified sets. So either white is the unqualified. Okay, and uh, in our protocols, we're going to assume that the adversary is going to be able to corrupt, corrupt some set of parties, um, and the adversary is only going to be able to corrupt one unqualified set. And if it, if it does that, then we say that our protocol is secure um, with respect to this access structure. Okay, so as I said, we're going to look at our arithmetic circuits, just a sequence of additions and multiplications. Um, we are going to do that uh, to, to enable computations of this form um, using a linear secret sharing scheme uh, for a Q2 access structure specifically. We're then going to show a passive multiplication protocol, and then we're going to show how to uh, perform some check to get some access security. Okay, so what is a linear secret sharing scheme? Well, suppose we've got some secret X and we want to share it amongst the parties. Um, that secret can be split into four pieces, x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x4, and then those pieces can be distributed amongst the parties. Okay, so in this case, um, you can see that, for example, party one collaborating with two or three or four will recover all four pieces of the secret, so they'll, learn, they'll be able to recover the secret. Okay, um, so actually this realizes that access structure we saw before, so any party collaborating, any of 2, 3, and 4 collaborating with 1 should learn the secret, and also notice 2, 3, and 4 working together should recover the secret, which is also what we have here. Okay, what's good about this scheme is that uh, we can add secrets um, that are shared in it uh, locally by local operations. There's no communication amongst the parties. So suppose we've got X and Y shared in the scheme. Parties can just sum the shares they have, and they've got a sharing of some of the secrets. We can also add public constants by the parties just deciding that um, uh, they should add the public value to one of the one of the shares, and so they have a sharing of x plus y. Okay, so previous work by Keller et al. showed that um, what you can do um, is share your secrets in a so-called replicated uh, using replicated secret sharing, um, and they showed that if you do that. Which is, um, of which this is an example. If you share it in that fashion, then every share is held by at least one on this party if the access structure is Q2. And because you have that, uh, make sure that if, you do, if you're do, you doing local additions, at least one on this party is going to be doing the correct local addition. So you kind of get some sort of active security when you're doing the linear operations locally. Okay, and what we show in this paper is that this isn't special to replicated secret sharing. This is actually, um, an aspect of the fact that the linear secret sharing scheme realizes a Q2 access structure. Okay, so um, we've shown that additions can be actively secure. Let's have a look at multiplications, because that's the other thing we need to do to do arithmetic circuits. Um, so suppose they want to multiply two secrets A and X and Y, and suppose they already have two secrets A and B, secret shares, and they've also got a sharing of the product, A times B. Uh, already secret shared, and it's and those A, B, and A times B are independent of the inputs X and Y. 
Okay, then we can use this technique called Beaver circuit normalization, which basically says the parties can open values x plus a and y plus b, um, which means that they uh, just send the shares that they hold for those two secrets to all other parties. And all the, all the parties will then be able to construct x plus a and y plus b. And because a and b are random and unknown to any party, that, that doesn't reveal anything about x and y. And the good thing about that is that then um, the parties can perform a, a linear operation on the secrets that they hold, x and y, and this product ab, and they can obtain the sharing of x times y. So if you see here, this is a public value, this is public, and this is subtracting a public value and adding a secret. So that's a linear operation. Okay, so what's the advantage of doing this? Well, what we can do is um, produce lots of these so-called Beaver triples, these A, B, and A, B uh, secrets in a so-called offline phase. And then in an online phase, um, what you have to do to, to, to perform additions for the arithmetic circuit is local, do some local operations that I've shown. And to do multiplication, you just have to open two secrets. Okay, so the efficiency of your online phase of your protocol it only depends on the cost of doing these openings, which is another thing that we look at in this paper, how to do these openings efficiently. And we also need to do this with active security, because we showed that the additions happen with active security by this property that every honest, every share is held by at least one honest party. Um, but we need to show that opening secrets, um, whatever that means, is something that can be done with active security too. Okay, so there's an idea by Furukawa et al, who showed that you um, can dispense with the MAC. So what is a MAC? A MAC is a message authentication code. Um, and it was basically a way of making sure that an adversary can't cheat in a protocol by requiring that it not only evaluates, the parties not only evaluate the circuit, but also a randomized version of the circuit, and then compare it to the, the non-randomized version and the randomized version um, at the end of the computation. Um, and making sure that they're consistent. So the idea was that to do um, in, in, with Furukawa et al, the idea was to um, get rid of all of this extra circuit randomization uh, that you have to do to, do to get active security, and instead make sure that the opening protocol happens securely. Okay, so how did it work? Well, again, this is a, uh, this, uh, uh, Secret X is shared using so-called replicated secret sharing. So if you look here, for example, party one can, uh, collaborating with party two can recover the secret. So we say that this is a 3-1 threshold access structure. And in order to open a secret, um, all we need is for one party to send one share to one other party, or all three parties to do that. So, um, so that, for example, P1 gets X23 from P3, and so you can recover the secret. Okay, but we need this with active security, so we need to make sure that this X23 received by uh, P1 from P3, this X23 on the left, is the same as the one that P23 holds on the right, because that's not guaranteed by this opening procedure. Okay, so what they showed is that basically if they take a hash of the, the what we call the share vector, which is just all of the shares, and they compare the hashes, then they can output x if all of the hashes match. And they know that it will only match if, uh, for example here, the x23 was the same as the one that p2 did not transmit. Okay, okay so why is this good? Well, um, producing max uh, and computing max in an online basis uh, quite a lot of computation effort, um, and uh, you have to map not only the secrets that you're evaluating on, but you have to produce a map on uh, these beaver triples, AB and AB, A times B, um, and that's quite an extensive operation because it's several multiplications throughout the, throughout the protocol. Um, and one of the big things about maps is that there's an operation that allows you to check things, uh, many, many secrets simultaneously, um, but using this hashing technique, um, you can also do uh, batch the checks because you can just update the hash function over lots of different openings and then do a single hash check once at the end of your computation. Um, this technique only works for Q2X structures, so um, 
if it's a full threshold access structure, um, which is where all the parties but one are assumed potentially corrupt. Um, you can't use this technique and you have to use more expensive stuff like uh, public key cryptography. Okay, so as I mentioned this uh, KRSW before, they showed that you can generalize this uh, uh, method of through Kala et al. Um, to work for any uh, access structure using replicated secret sharing. Um, so you can see here that P1 is sending four elements, but um, asymptotically it only has to send to half the other parties. And it's basically the same as the through Kala et al. protocol. So they send the elements, they check the hashes are the same, and then they only output the secret um, if, if all the hashes match. Okay, but the disadvantage of this is that it scales by poorly the number of parties. Um, this is just a, so if you've got 15 parties and, and you assume that seven of them are, um, at least se uh, at most seven of them are corrupt, then you still have to send thousands of field elements uh, for every party, for every secret you want to open, which is really, really inefficient. Okay, so what we showed in this work is that you don't have to use this replicated secret sharing, which is really expensive. It grows as something like 2 to the n over root n. Um, you can, in fact, use any secret sharing scheme that realizes the Q2 access structure. So, for example, um, if you've got a, a, a threshold access structure, you can use uh, Shamir secret sharing. Um, so, just to give you an idea, if you're not familiar with it, if you have uh, two parties of you are corrupt, then uh, you can sample a degree two polynomial such that the y-intercept is the secret, and then you give um, one distinct point to each party, and then if there's three or more parties, they can interpolate the, the polynomial using the branch interpolation um, and, and recover the secret. Okay, so what's the advantage of Shamir secret sharing in this case? Well, each party now only has to send one element to one other party, instead of four to three different parties. And then they can run the, the branch interpolation uh, to compute the secret, and then they can hash the secret and compare uh, the hashes that they have. And again, you can amortize the cost of doing this opening uh, by just updating the hash over several secrets. Okay, so instead of 3,003 elements per party, it's now only seven elements, which is quite a reduction. Okay, so what we showed was that this works for any Q2 access structure and for any secret sharing scheme um, that you want to use using uh, realizing the access structure. And I haven't talked about uh, how to generate these um, so-called beaver triples, these A, B, and A times B. And in general, that's a, a reasonably expensive um, computation. Um, this paper, the KRSW that I mentioned, uh, has a relatively efficient way of doing it for small num numbers of parties. Um, and as a result, by Kramer, Damgaard, and Ishaf, it says you can convert a replicated secret sharing into a secret sharing under any other um, secret sharing scheme by a, only a local operation. So somehow replicated secret sharing is maximal. Um, so what you could do is use KRSW and then do a local operation to convert this uh, to um, any secret sharing scheme. But uh, the cost of doing that is quite large because the setup for generating these random secrets with replicated sharing is quite expensive. You have to uh, generate basically exponentially many, again, 2 to the n over root n, PRF keys, if any is the number of parties. So that's not great. Um, so what you can do is to uh, use some other method to generate those um, random beaver triples, um, which is what we did in our implementation, which you can find at that uh, URL. Um, and we thought about uh, how to, how we might uh, improve this work. Um, and uh, for example, there's a recent result by Chida et al. which showed how to combine. So we split the computation into an offline and online phase. Um, Chida et al. showed how to kind of combine it to save some of the costs. Um, we thought about uh, how to improve the offline phase. As I said, uh, it's quite expensive to use KRSW and to convert. So we thought about how to um, change this a bit, but this, that's still an open question. Um, but what we did show was basically that finding a good um, MPC protocol 
uh, for QTO access structures can be reduced to finding an efficiency for sharing schemes that realizes it. Okay, and that's it. Thanks for listening.